road uh, in the time of my grandmother's grandmother. And another million within 18 months left the country and uh, most of them came here. And that's why you have uh, so many Irish um, and people with Irish ancestry, including your new president, um, part of whose mother's uh, line uh, originates in the uh, Midlands of Ireland. We became in independent in 1922, and the decline in population from 8 million on the entire island in 1841, some years before the famine, continued for 50 more years. When I was going to school, when I began to go to school in the early 60s, the population of Ireland had sunk to 2.9 million in the south, with 1.5 million in Northern Ireland. That meant you had uh, less than 4.5 million people, whereas in 1841, there were more than 8 million people. So it was a, t it was a sad economic and demographic tale uh, that Ireland presented to the world um, for over 100 years. In 1972, Ireland voted to join the European Union in its first enlargement. And we joined with, uh, together with Great Britain and, um, and Denmark. We had applied in the late 50s, early 60s, to join the European Union because we thought it was good for us. It would be good economically and for many other reasons. Our application fell foul of a French uh, veto, not particularly a veto on our application, uh, but a veto on the British application, which came at the same time. And that was all to do with the relationship between France and the United Kingdom in those years, and a certain willfulness on the part of the French head of state at the time. But eventually Ireland joined the Union in, um, in 1973, um, and our fortunes were transformed. Um, we had spent many years uh, in the shadow, if you like, of Great Britain, this island behind an island. Even in the good days, and there were good days um, in those years, in the relationship between Great Britain and Ireland, we were nonetheless locked as a nation in the very tight embrace of a powerful and large and influential neighbour. And what membership of the European Union did for us was more than providing financial assistance, more than providing incentives for uh, Americans and Koreans and others to invest in Ireland. It transformed the country psychologically and enabled us to leap beyond that tight and overly tight embrace of our nearest neighbour and to participate at all levels of public and private life, governmental, business organisations, unions, teachers, students, and everything else in a wider European context as an equal member of the European Union. The other thing that the European Union did for us was it made us very attractive as a destination for inward mobile investment from the United States, from um, Japan, uh, Korea, and further afield. Because countries that lay beyond Europe were, then, were now able to invest in Ireland, manufacture in Ireland, generate services in Ireland, and have immediate access to the large European Union market for those things because they were inside the fence. So they did not have to pay import duty or any other kind of access taxes. Ireland, of course, has an English-speaking uh, population. Uh, the government, successive governments, placed great emphasis on developing the education sector, particularly in the technical areas. I can talk to you about that later if you like. Um, the tax arrangements were very positive. The defeated candidate in the, in the recent uh, presidential election, uh, Senator McCain, kept quoting our situation, uh, the modern situation where the corporation tax in the United States averages across the states at 35%. In Ireland, it's 12.5%. And that's a very real incentive for, um, for outside companies, particularly those beyond the union, as I say, uh, to invest in Ireland. So why, if we had all of these benefits uh, flowing from membership of the European Union, did Ireland vote no during the summer 
in June. And that's your question. Why did Ireland vote no um, in, the, uh, in the referendum on the Lisbon Treaty? It's a complicated hinterland. It's a complicated question. It, it appears very simple. What the Irish did not vote no to was, they did not vote no to our membership of the Union. They did not vote no to our strong commitment to be at the centre of the development of the Union. What they voted no to was a particular treaty, the Lisbon Treaty, uh, which has emerged from negotiation in recent years for, um, I won't even say restructuring, for adapting the structures and procedures of the Union uh, to the modern age and adapting it to the fact that there are now 27 members. When the European Union was established as the EEC in the 1950s under the Rome Treaty, there were only six member states. In 2004, we had the most recent enlargement, and there are now 27 member states. Now, the practices evolved over the years, but the Lisbon Treaty has tried now to consolidate all the evolution and practice and to put in place a framework uh, to run the, uh, the Union uh, more efficiently and more effectively as a Union of 27 members. To do all that, it was a very detailed document. Yay thick. I could have brought it along, but it was a bit heavy, actually. And the, we were in the unfortunate position that the Irish were the only, was the, the Irish were the only nation. Ireland was the only country in the European Union which had to ratify this treaty by means of public referendum. All of the other countries have been ratifying the treaty by way of parliamentary vote uh, and such like, which means that the uh, majorities in Parliament, and there might be a commanding majority in Parliament, were able to ratify the treaty, and so France and Spain and Sweden have all done this. We, if you like to say unfortunately, were the only ones who, by virtue of our own uh, domestic uh, arrangements, uh, the government had to put it to the people in a popular vote. And it's a very difficult proposition to put a document, Yethic, um, even, uh, even if it is only an adaptation of what already exists, um, to put it to a public vote, have the general public understand it, uh, have the general public be sufficiently interested in it uh, to turn out on election day and vote in favour of it. And I'm afraid that, the, um, that the, uh, the principal reason why the Irish voted against the treaty was because, frankly speaking, it was very complex and they didn't understand it. The man in the street didn't understand it. And his reaction and her reaction was if it is so complex, if it is so large, there must be something in it. I don't understand it, so if in doubt, leave it out. I'm going to vote no. It was a huge shock for the country and a huge shock for Europe that the Irish, who had benefited so much from the Union, voted down the treaty that was going to consolidate the recent reforms. It's left us with a problem. Uh, it's left the European Union with a problem also because um, we are still a member of the Union. The rest of the countries are progressively ratifying the Lisbon Treaty. Um, and soon enough, there will probably be 26 of them. And then there will be 26 and one. And we're going to have to figure out how we handle that. The government um, in Ireland, shortly after the referendum vote, which was about 52 or 53 percent to 47 percent, on a reasonable turnout, a turnout of almost 60%, uh, the government decided that we have to listen to what the people said. Uh, we have to pay respect to what the people said at the polls. We are a democracy, like the United States is a democracy. So if the people have spoken, we have to study what they said, and we have to take it uh, from there. General Franco used to say, that the trouble with democratic votes is you can never be sure of the outcome. 
And I think he, uh, he didn't like democratic elections for the same reason, but at least he understood what he was talking about. He understood why he didn't like it. <laughs>